This is Jack Lipton, and today I'm inaugurating the Critical Minerals Institute report. And our first guest is going to be Mr. Ian London, who is the executive director of the CQMQA. And Ian, could you please tell us what CQMQA is <laughs> first? Thank you. Uh, good to see you, Jack. Thanks for the invitation. And I knew you were going to do this for to me. Uh, C2M2A, the Canadian Critical Minerals and Materials Alliance is a group of a dozen plus companies and organizations, not just corporate entities, but uh, commercial laboratories and others and a number of affiliates who have been active in the critical minerals and materials space. And we'll get into that dialogue uh, shortly. Um, and international organizations and do a lot of work with our friends at the federal government and provincial governments in helping Canada move this uh, tremendous opportunity uh, forward. Ian, can you give us a, a brief CV of, of your own background and, and how you came to this position? Oh, there's an interesting one. Um, I'm actually a metallurgist by degree. Uh, have never really practiced, got involved uh, in my early career as a mechanical engineer, primarily and spent most of my career in the power sector, which also plays an important role in the critical materials today. Um, and then got involved after a long career in, in the power sector and the international, ran Ontario Hydro International. So we've worked in 80 countries. I moved into the industrial uh, supply chain sector, and that's components that build turbine, uh, gas turbines. These are nuts, bolts, screws, and other machine engineered components, uh, MRI machines, et cetera. So I've got a clear sense of uh, how supply chains work. And about 15 years ago, when you and I first met, Jack, I got involved in the critical material space, then known as rare earths, or everything was captured by rare earth. It could have been battery materials. It could have been anything. If it was unique and appeared on a periodic table, it fell under the uh, the banner of rare earth. That, of course, has since expanded or been realized. There are several supply chains under the uh, rare, uh, you know, under critical materials. It's not just rare earth. There are battery materials. There are light weighting materials. There are electronics material chains. Okay. And, and based on your, your experience, your extensive experience and background, I really just have one question for you today. What do you see as the future for Canada in, in the production and processing and end use of critical minerals and materials? I think Canada has tremendous opportunities and is starting to, or finally, moving the agenda forward. Canada has, is in a rather unique position. We're primarily, we have had a long tradition of mining and metallurgy oil and gas, in the resource sector, forestry. Canada has a strong background in that. But it also has tremendous metallurgical capabilities. Uh, had the steel industries, nickel, copper. Canadians, as a matter of fact, most mining projects around the world are actually financed through the Venture Exchange or the Toronto Stock Exchange. So a strong history in the mining and, and, uh, and metallurgical aspects. Canada also enjoys strong industrial background, the automotive industry, you know, with our American friends south of the border. Um, you get into telecom, the Bell, Bell Northern. These were all Canadian organizations and have a strong industrial and manufacturing base, Bombardier and Eric Aircraft, just to name a couple. It also has strong trade relationships. One thing Australian has, et cetera, is strong trading relationship with the U.S., the Europeans, uh, you know, and, and the Far East. So if you bring all those together, and if you look at the transition for climate, uh, new technologies and all that, it's all gonna be based on collaboration and filling in supply chain. So Canada is perfectly uh, situated to do that. But it has to be more than, uh, shall we say, aspirational. Competitive markets are challenging nowadays and Canada needs to, shall we say, uh, up its game. Potential is there. Yes, there are challenges, as any new uh, new industries and emerging sectors will have, but Canada's clearly in the right spot to do this. That's uh, very <laughs> concise. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm interested, uh, for, in your opinion, on the difference in outlook and capabilities of, of Canada and Australia and the U.S. 
Can, can you can you opine on that for a moment in in critical minerals and materials? Yeah. Well, I have to admire some of the the, the Australians have become very aggressive and progressive on the critical material front, critical minerals front. They're primarily a mining nation. Uh, yeah, has some industrial uh, base, but they're, they're primarily uh, uh, mining uh, miners and financers of mining type operations and now front end uh, processing. They have been quite aggressive on the rarer side with the great success of Linus. You know, they actually got into the separation and more downstream processing, but primarily uh, in the mineral side of the equation. As part of the C2M2A, I mentioned minerals and materials. At the end of the day, auto manufacturers don't buy minerals. They buy lightweighted frames. They buy electronics. They buy completed batteries. They don't buy lithium. <laughs> they may want to secure lithium supply, but they buy batteries because they're assembly plants. And they bring in, uh, you know, what's the biggest holdup nowadays or was over the last while in the automotive sector? It wasn't critical minerals. They need semiconductors manufactured elsewhere. Even if we had the raw materials or have, we do have the raw materials supplied to them, you've got to put them in a form that could be integrated into an industrial base. Canada has an industrial base. It's in the oil gas business. It's in the manufacturing business. It builds aircrafts. It has steel mills. It has large aluminum manufacturers. Well, if you can produce aluminum and you have critical materials such as a uh, mineral, such as uh, some of the rare earths, We've now developed a number of lightweighted materials, which would take the weight off an automotive, uh, auto automobile, uh, improve its electronics and lightweight it through aluminum, uh, you know, scandium type alloys. Lots of potential. So Australia, I see as, um, well, and we have great relationships and working relationships from a C2M2A perspective with our Australian friends and on the international front of them, but they're primarily miners, front end metallurgists, Canada has the resources, uh, will get into them. They have some large producers already, um, but has the manufacturing base and the industrial base and the trade relationships with the automotive. As you see battery plants being announced and where are they being announced? Right around the automotive industry. We've got to connect anodes, cathodes, lithium supply into it, agreed. The Australians seem to be a little more aggressive on the mineral side. One last question to wrap up your uh, Nostradamus uh, version of yourself. <laughs> um, looks to me like the immediate demand for all of these materials out, outside of China is, go, is Europe. And what, what's your position on where Europe is going to source its materials and its act, maybe processing and even manufacturing of components? Yeah. Uh... And in particular, Europe nowadays, with the challenges it has on energy supply, et cetera. The Europeans, the Chancellor of Germany was just in Canada a week, two ago, et cetera, and was quite clear. Looking at, as they say, raw material supplies, I'm not crazy about the announcement in that regard, would like raw material supply so they can process it. And I understand you want the value added jobs. I don't think Canada should give them up as quickly. One of the key elements for our European friends, where Canada is well positioned, and that's on ESG, sustainability, environmental governance and sustainability kind of measures and values. Because at the end of the day, their end components, the Volvos, or the, uh, uh, the Volkswagens, the, the Mercedes, are gonna be producing products which would need to be sustainable and it's part of their value system. I think Canada, is in a great position to do that. Many of its companies are already moving forward uh, through the Mining Association of Canada uh, towards sustainable mining, have reporting mechanisms, which are now adopted in 10, 12 countries. Canada, with our Australian friends, are actually leading some of the effort at the International Standards Organization on standards around critical materials. So Europe will drive it at the end of the day. They're big consumers. They also have the end product manufacturing. We're Canada, you know, we're automotive assemblers, et cetera, but they're the next generation. I'm strongly committed to clean power, uh, environmentally or ESG reporting, quality product, which Canada and, the, uh, and our Australian friends can produce. The Americans are coming along. I'm not discounting them. They are, uh, 
they're still be a little behind in my sense, not as aggressive. They have big dollars uh, behind it. Uh, Canada is committed to it, still a bit aspirational. And on the mineral side, the Australian friends are moving forward quite aggressively. Uh, thank you, Ian. I, I'm going to I'm going to let you off the hook right now. And thank you for being our initial guest on this series. And we're going to have you back uh, sometime in the near future to see how many, if any, of your predictions and prognostications come true. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for your time, Jack, and good to see you again.